Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. Sarah Ellefson, a postdoctoral fellow at Baylor College of Medicine. So Sarah, I'm familiar with you from when we worked together at Purdue, but for everyone else listening, would you mind giving the audience a short introduction of yourself and what your background is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So like you said, my name is Sarah. I really got into swine nutrition when I was an undergrad at Purdue University. I got to work with uh, Drs. Ricker and Radcliffe there, and they kind of sparked my love for swine nutrition. And I believe that's actually where we crossed paths and and met as well. So that was really fun. Um, I was then fortunate enough to go down to University of Kentucky and work with Dr. Merlin Lindemann for my master's. Um, then continued my journey on to Iowa State University, where I worked with Dr. Laura Greiner for my PhD. So a little bit about my master's, we looked at just general growth and development and the physiological responses in the pig with their organs and intestinal maturation. And then when I was with Dr. Greiner, I looked at um, vitamin A and how that can affect pig growth and their immune system. And now I've moved on to, to Baylor <laughs> College of Medicine for a postdoc fellowship, and it's been fun. Awesome. So I read that study you sent me last night about different swine sampling techniques and the effects of certain techniques and what they may have on samples and that not everyone may be aware of. So would you mind telling us about that study? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So that study is actually a combination of a lot of, I'm going to call them little mini studies that I did. And a lot of these were just questions that I had when I was going through um, my PhD program with Dr. Greiner and I was trying to collect samples for my vitamin A analysis and there's just a lot of inconsistencies across the literature about how samples should be taken. And so the very first thing that we looked at was just vitamin A sensitivity to light and then the inconsistency of using serum or plasma tubes. And so I just kind of, you know, said, hey, Dr. Greiner, I'm not exactly sure the best way to do this. And I was very fortunate that she kind of said, well, let's, you know, write up an eye cook and then just run a quick little study on it. And so I did um, just went out, sampled a few pigs and then had that analyzed for for vitamin A to see if there was any differences across the collection techniques. Um, and then we were at kind of, you know, sitting there looking at the vitamin A results and we're like, well, wouldn't this be cool for a few of the other, you know, nutrients. And so we went ahead and looked at also vitamin E and vitamin D, which are some of the other fast soluble vitamins, just to see, you know, kind of sample analysis had taken off at that point. And there's questions about the proper way or which blood tube to use. And so we figured we already had the samples collected, we should go ahead and and look at it. And so that was great. And that got me started on some of my projects. Um, And then I went to work on a sow trial where sows are limit fed and not ad lib fed. And I was curious that if the when I took a blood sample from a sow who maybe had a meal earlier that morning, if we'd see a difference in her vitamin status versus compared to when she had just eaten a meal and how long that would go. So then that kind of led to a second study where we um, were able to feed pigs and then take blood samples over the course of 12 hours to see if there was any potential spikes in the nutrients in the bloodstream from when they ate the meal um, until that 12 hour mark out. And for that one, we ended up looking up at vitamin A and E. Um, The common trend across these is going to be vitamin A because that's what I was interested in for my dissertation. At that point, we'd kind of gotten a lot to get me going on my studies. We found that there was, you know, a couple peaks around hours four to six for a lot of fat soluble vitamins in the bloodstream. And so that kind of helped me to determine when to take blood. And then I've noticed that a lot of my blood samples, some of them would have a slight pink hinge to them. So that's represent a representative of uh, hemolysis or when the red blood cells kind of burst and leak into the plasma. And I've read a couple multiple papers on different degrees of hemolysis can impact the nutrient status of what the sample is that's being analyzed. And so I kind of did this another study. Um, I've been very lucky to get to do a lot of studies with this work where I was able to take some blood samples and I all the blood samples I just kind of aliquoted it into three test tubes per pig. And then I prayed and hoped that the first blood sample I took wasn't hem- um, hemolyzed at all, which I was very fortunate about on that, that they weren't. And then I took a second blood sample um, and took a syringe needle and aspirated it. So I just ran the blood sample through the syringe to kind of break up those red blood cells using sheer force. Um, I did that about five times to achieve what I called a medium level of hemolysis. So just kind of that nice pink color that we see in the plasma. 
And then I went and sonified a third aliquot of that blood sample to really break up the red blood cells and achieve what we considered a high level of hemolysis. Um, and we looked and saw that pretty much if you have any sort of hemolysis to your plasma sample, that we're going to see a difference across vitamins A and E and multiple trace minerals. So moral of that story is don't hemolyze your, your samples if you can help it at all. <laughs> uh, and then kind of the last two studies I looked at in that sample handling was if we can have degradation across our tissue and serum samples. And at first, this kind of started with liver because we were curious if we put our liver at um, in the fridge while we were out at the farm during collections, if that would affect what we would see in our vitamin A. So I was able to take a section of liver, divide it up into about 10 different segments. Um, I snap froze some so that they were immediately frozen. And then I left other sections out at either minus 20, 4 or 20. So either the, the freezer, the fridge or room temperature for up to 12 hours. And we analyzed that and saw that there really wasn't any difference in our vitamin A and E concentrations in our liver tissue. But then that kind of sparked the question that if we have tissue samples and wanted to send them to diagnostics, would they be okay in just a cooler for about two days? So at that point, I was able to collect um, some more samples. So in this case, I got serum and liver, and I just kind of left them in a cooler on a bench top, a styrofoam cooler with some ice packs um, for up to two days before I process them, so spun down the serum or took a liver sample out and put it in the minus 80 and then analyzed that for um, vitamins A and E. And it was really cool because we also didn't see any degradation of those two vitamins for those samples as well. So it was just kind of a whole bunch of little series that we just wanted to see what would happen. And they're just kind of simple questions that we weren't able to find the answers to. And I was curious about and was able to have free reign and could explore. Gotcha. So Going back to that one that you talked about with the hemolysis, so when taking blood samples, are there any like specific handling techniques that may cause hemolysis that like people should avoid or what's what's the biggest risk factor you think there? Yeah, I, I from just reading and experience myself, I feel like hemolysis occurs a lot if blood is taken with a smaller needle in a syringe and it's collected that way and then forced back through the needle into the vacuum container. Um, you just expose the sample to a little bit more of that sheer force and kind of run the risk of bursting those red blood cells. Additionally, if you violently shake a tube while you're trying to invert it, so if you're doing a plasma collection, if you shake it hard enough, you also run the risk of rupturing those red blood cells and calling, causing a degree of hemolysis. Gotcha. And then also a question about the, the two liver studies. Um, so that one seemed to be a little bit more stable, I guess, than some of the other studies you did, and there weren't as many differences. So you might be just hypothesizing here, but why do you think the liver seemed, well, yeah, more stable than those other samples? Yeah, absolutely. Um, honestly, it was just one of those things and our serum ended up being relatively stable too, where we didn't see a difference, but I was just kind of having the instance where, you know, we found a sample that in, maybe instead of going immediately into the freezer was left on ice for a little bit. And I was curious to see that if there was a um, a difference in the vitamin levels are, you know, with serum, it's a little easier to keep track of because you have to uh, spin it down in the centrifuge and then you aliquot that out. But sometimes it's easy to forget a piece of tissue that's left in a bag. And so I was just kind of curious, you know, is there a difference in our level of vitamins in that tissue if it is accidentally left out or put it in improper temperature? Or if you're out at the farm and you don't have a cooler immediately, um, can't, you know, immediately freeze the tissue. Uh, what would happen. And so that's kind of what sparked me looking into the liver. And then after we saw that there wasn't any difference across the vitamin A and E concentrations for about 12 hours, then we kind of took it up that step and went out to two days. And then we also looked to see if serum was any different across those time frames as well. Gotcha. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, share these studies with us and it can help, you know, probably a lot of grad students who are going to be taking a lot of samples in the future. So yeah, thank you for all the work you put into those studies. Absolutely. Thank you for having me here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And to everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode and we are constantly on the lookout for the latest updates in swine nutrition. And if you have a swine nutrition related research trial that you would be able to share on our podcast, please send an email to nutritionblackbelt at swineit.com and we would love to talk about your research. See you later.